The Playdate is this handheld console that came out earlier this year, and it's no secret that the price tag of $179 is a contentious one. In every single unboxing and review video about the Playdate, without fail, there are hundreds of comments talking about how expensive the Playdate is. There's some truth to that. The Playdate screen has no color, it's one bit, and has no backlight. It's also not cross-platform. You can only play games on it that are specifically made for the Playdate. It's also not the most powerful device. In the current competitive marketplace of amazing handhelds like the Switch, the Steam Deck, and the Miu Mini, what place does the Playdate have with its current price? I'm here to talk about that because I believe no video has come even close to talking about the exact value proposition of the Playdate and if it's worth the price that it's asking for. I myself have spent over a thousand hours using the Playdate and making games for the thing. No joke, you can check out my channel. Over the last 11 months, I've been making a video about the Playdate almost every single week. In this way, I believe I'm more well positioned than the vast majority of people to talk about this topic. Clearly, I'm a fan of the Playdate, so you might think I would make the argument that the Playdate is not too expensive and is well worth the money, but I actually wouldn't make that argument. I've been thinking about this a lot, and my answer is surprisingly yes, the Playdate is actually too expensive for the vast majority of people. However, I believe that there is a specific subset of the consumer base where the Playdate is actually far more valuable than the price that it's asking for and is actually very cheap for what it offers. To find out which group you're in, keep watching so you can come away with an informed purchasing decision. To talk about this topic in any reasonable nuance, we need to first talk about what defines expensive. Expensive at first glance might seem to be a direct function of price. So if something costs more, it's more expensive. Of course, we know that not to be true. A new iPhone 14 costs around $799. This 55 gallon drum of motor oil costs around the same at $766. While they're around the same price, you probably wouldn't buy the drum of motor oil since you don't need that much. To you, the drum would seem expensive. However, a mechanic might be willing to buy it since it has value to them. So to them, it might not be considered expensive. From this, we can see that something being expensive is somewhat of a subjective description. However, expensive can also be somewhat of an objective thing. If Skittles suddenly raised the price of a bag of candy to $1,000, then sales would plummet because the underlying value of candy is not that high, and also there are competing products to switch to. You can then make the argument from any perspective that Skittles is too expensive. So for the Playdate, I'll try to make a subjective argument if the Playdate is expensive based on some consumer preferences, and then I'll try to make an objective argument if the Playdate is overpriced based on some more concrete data. First, I'll generalize potential Playdate consumers into five different groups based on consumer preferences. Then you can slot yourself into one of these five groups to see if the Playdate is too expensive for you. These are all assuming you're a gamer who's interested in handhelds. The first group is a consumer who's mainly interested in AAA games. You like high fidelity games with state of the art graphics and lots of playable content. Games like Red Dead Redemption, Breath of the Wild, Elden Ring, etc. In this case, yes, the Playdate is not for you and is way too expensive based on your tastes. For $20 more, you can buy the Switch Lite, and for $3.99, you can buy the Steam Deck, which is a much better use of your money if you have these interests. Of course, I would have thought this is an obvious distinction, but apparently not based on the comments that I read. Comments like, this thing is too expensive, I would maybe spend $50 on this. The key word is I. Yes, for you, you are not the core demographic of the Playdate. The Playdate has a 1-bit 400 by 240 pixel display. There's a clear retro appeal. This is not for the average gamer, so I would make the argument that whether they think this is too expensive or not is largely irrelevant. The second group is the consumer who has more of an interest in retro and indie games. Indie games like Hollow Knight or The Binding of Isaac, or Game Boy classics like Advance Wars or A Link to the Past. This is an actual potential customer of the Playdate, unlike the previous group. However, in this case, I would still make the argument that the Playdate is too expensive. For a fraction of the cost, you can get something like the Miu Mini that can emulate an almost endless number of retro games for the low price of $64. However, if you have some disposable income and you're interested, you may consider getting a Playdate. The third group is where it gets a little bit more interesting. This is if you're a consumer looking for unique and novel gaming experiences and you're interested in seeing what creative indie devs can come up with. Of course, there's the crank, which is a unique input mechanism and it spawns game archetypes that can't readily be found on other game platforms. But there are also some extremely creative people working on some amazing games. For example, Diora from the 3D Printus, which also has a built-in level editor, or P-Racing, this incredible looking racing game, or The Legend of Etad, a unique dungeon crawler. If you look on itch.io right now under the Playdate tag, you'll find hundreds of games made by different developers. As mentioned before, games have to be made specifically for the Playdate, so you can't find these on any other platform. This is the first year that the Playdate has been out, and not even all units have been shipped yet, yet there's this bustling community of developers. Every day I'm on different forums and Discord communities around the Playdate, 
and there's a lot of energy around Playdate development. I think next year we'll see an explosion of extremely creative and unique games made exclusively for the Playdate. So if you don't have one, you're going to miss out on this kind of experience. I cannot understate the community aspect of this as well. I've never seen anything like this where the members are as passionate about this as they are. Everything is community run and driven. We even had a community awards show recently. In that sense, I think the Playdate is worth the money if you want to be a part of that. The fourth group is that of developers. If you're interested in making games, the Playdate is a unique platform. Limitation breeds creativity, and the low resolution one bit screen forces you to be extremely creative. It's been the most fun I've ever had making games. There's also something extremely satisfying about being able to make something and see it come to life in your hands. Of course, there are some equivalent experiences. Two other prominent ones are one, using Pico 8 in conjunction with one of the many handhelds that supports Pico 8 games, which would come out to around $100, or making games for the Arju Boy, which would come out to around $60. However, as a developer, you might know that one of the most important things is the developer experience. As a full-time software engineer, I've worked with many frameworks and libraries, but the Playdate Software Development Kit has been one of the most enjoyable development environments I've ever worked with. Not only that, but the iteration loop is extremely quick as well. It takes seconds to rebuild a project and takes less than 10 seconds to upload it onto your device so you can get it testing on physical hardware immediately. It's an insane and amazing feeling. If you're a game developer and you're looking to have something really creatively challenge you and you want to have fun making games, I would say that the Playdate is definitely worth it. Of course, you can sell your games as well. I've made over $1,500 selling my Playdate games, and while it's not a crazy amount, it's paid for itself many times over. The fifth and final group is for people who have never coded in their entire life, but want to learn how to make games. This is a particularly unique value prop that the Playdate has. Panic has made a free game making tool called Pulp that you can use to make games for the Playdate, and it's been designed with new developers in mind. If you want to upgrade, you can also use Lua to make games, which is a relatively simple language to pick up and use. I personally talked to dozens of people who wanted to make games their whole life and have never programmed, but finally made the leap when they got the Playdate. There are hundreds of games on itch.io for the Playdate that are people's first ever game. There's something about the approachability of Playdate development, as well as the limitations that make it particularly conducive to new developers. I've made a ton of tutorials on various aspects of Playdate development, and I'm planning on making a lot more next year, so it's only going to get easier. If you're interested in learning how to make games, but you've never been able to make the leap, then the Playdate might be a worthwhile investment. Okay, we talked about if the Playdate is subjectively too expensive based on different consumer preferences, but if we want to talk about the claims that the Playdate is objectively overpriced, we need to dig into the economics. To me, this is the most interesting part because I think we can really peel back the layers on pricing and consumer sentiment in the gaming industry as a whole. However, before we talk about that, can we take a quick aside to talk about how everyone thinks that the crank is meant to power the Playdate? This is a packet of sticky notes, and this is the Playdate. They're literally the same size. The thickness of the Playdate is less than the width of my pinky finger. The crank arm is about as long as one segment of my index finger. I don't know if you've ever taken a physics class, but the mechanics of this just does not work. The crank will never be able to generate any meaningful amount of electricity based off its size. Plus, the Playdate has a really good battery life. I can go days without charging it. Personally, I think it's much more interesting as a unique input device rather than some charging gimmick. <laughs> Thanks for humoring me. Now back to the topic about the economics behind whether the Playdate is too expensive. We can dissect this from three different angles. The first is from market response. Did the Playdate manage to hit their sales target at the price that they sold it at, indicating that the market thought the Playdate was reasonably priced and therefore willing to buy it? The second angle is a competitor analysis. Is the Playdate reasonably priced compared to other consoles, taking all other factors into consideration? Lastly, we can take a look at it at a pure cost investment angle. Is the manufacturing cost and design cost added up, plus some reasonable profit margin markup, approximately equivalent to the price of the Playdate? The first angle is quite easy to look into. When Panic first opened pre-orders for the Playdate, they sold 20,000 units in the first 20 minutes. They completely sold out of the 2021 batch. Not only that, but they're completely back-ordered all the way until early 2023, as seen from this Playdate owner's update. It seems from here they have at least 50,000 units sold and planned to ship. I would say that it's reasonable to assume that Panic has smashed their sales targets. In this regard, consumers have spoken with their wallets and deemed that the Playdate to be reasonably priced. Of course, smashing sales targets is not the only indication of a well-priced product. I've seen comments likening the Playdate to the Ouya, which is an infamous failed console that raised $8.5 million on Kickstarter and sold 200,000 units. However, the Playdate differs from the Ouya in many key ways. 
First, Panic is now some no-name startup whose only product is the Playdate. The company was founded 25 years ago in 1997 and specializes in Mac software and iOS software, not hardware devices. They dipped their toes into the video game industry in 2016 by helping Campo Santo publish Firewatch, and again in 2019 by helping House House publish Untitled Goose Game. The Playdate is just their first foray into hardware. They're quite established and have an extremely strong reputation. Another way that they differ from the Ouya is that the Playdate has been in the hands of customers for almost a year now, and they've completely delivered on their promises on the product side. There's no bait and switch in terms of expectations and product, unlike the Ouya, who vastly overhyped their product. The second angle is from a competitor perspective. How is it that the Switch Lite is only $20 more expensive, but so much more advanced from a hardware perspective? Well, first, the Playdate comes with 24 games included, which make up for a significant portion of its value, but let's ignore that for now and talk about that in the next section. One obvious difference is the sheer magnitude of production. As of March this year, 18.4 million units of the Switch Lite have been shipped. That's more than 300 times the number of Playdates sold. The reason why this matters is a concept called economies of scale. You know when you buy a single bar of candy, it might cost $1, but if you buy a whole bag of 10, it might cost $8? The seller makes less per candy bar, but overall you spent more, so they make more money. The same thing happens all the way down the supply chain. Manufacturers are incentivized to give discounts on larger orders because they make more revenue and therefore more profit. In addition, any upfront capital investment is spread out more the more units are manufactured. Let's say it costs $10,000 to make a custom mold for your console. If you only sell 10,000 units, that's an additional dollar that needs to be tacked on to every unit sold. However, if you sell 1 million units, that's only an additional 1 cent that needs to be added on to every unit. Therefore, the more units you manufacture, the more you can substantially drive down the cost. In addition, big companies like Nintendo have an incredible amount of leverage because of their large customer base and also their proven track record. Both Nintendo and manufacturers know that whoever becomes the key manufacturer for the Nintendo Switch will make a lot of money. Nintendo knows this, and they can use this to make manufacturers bid against one another and drive down their own costs in order to become the key manufacturer. Companies like Apple are notorious for doing this to great success in order to drive down costs and pass off the savings to the consumer, or just take more profit. According to this article from Game Developer, Nintendo used aggressive price-cutting efforts to drive down the cost of the Switch Lite from changing battery suppliers all the way to spending months back and forth over the price of a single component. Panic had no proven track record in regards to these hardware products, so they basically have zero leverage in regards to these negotiations. And the number of units sold is relatively so much lower that they can't take advantage of economies of scale as much. They also only have around 25 employees, so they can't reasonably spend the human capital required to engage in a months long back and forth over a single component. There's also another concept that console manufacturers can use to drive down the cost of the product, which is called the lost leader. You know how the Costco hot dog has stayed $1.50 despite record inflation, and it still comes with a drink? Well, you go to Costco because the food is so cheap, but then you decide to stay to buy some groceries because you're there already. The hot dog is unprofitable, but Costco willingly takes a loss in order for you to come to the store and they can make up the difference from you buying things. The same can be applied to consoles as well. According to this article from Eurogamer, Microsoft loses up to $200 on each Xbox sold. However, you're not going to have an Xbox with no games, so Microsoft can recuperate its losses from the sales of its games. The PS5 sells at a profit, but the 399 Digital Edition does not. And also, when the PS4 was first launched, it was also sold at a loss. The Steam Deck likely sells at a loss, but I can't confirm it because the data is not made public. Of course, not every console sells at a loss. According to a Nikkei Technology report, the Switch costs about $257 to manufacture and sells at $299, so they make about $42 in profit. I couldn't find anything about the Switch Lite, but considering how hard it was to get it to the $200 price point, I imagine they're working with razor-thin profit margins. So while it might technically not be a loss leader, it might functionally be if they're barely making a profit on each device. Panic has no licensing for any of the games made for the Playdate. So unlike other consoles where the company takes a big cut of the game sales, I've made games for the Playdate and sold them on itch.io, and Panic has not seen a single cent from that. Therefore, there's no way for them to utilize reducing their profit margins on the console in order to recoup costs through game sales. At the end of the day, the Playdate is a niche product from a small company that cannot compete on price with any of these big players, so you can't really compare apples to apples. Lastly, we get to the cost investment angle. This gets pretty interesting. Remember how I mentioned economies of scale and leverage? We can actually see how that affects Panic's manufacturing costs because we have quotes directly from the Panic team. According to this tweet response from the official Panic account, the Playdate costs $98 to manufacture. Now, is that including manufacturing costs like assembly or just the cost of the parts? 
At $98, that's already over half the cost of the Playdate. So if it's not including the assembly and other manufacturing costs, then it would get really expensive. Well, we actually have an answer for that. From the Playdate Squad Discord server, we have a quote from Nevin Mergen, one of the employees at Panic. They comment that the $98 price tag doesn't include any of the assembly, testing, factory setup, or packaging. On top of that, there's also the cost of ordering expensive prototypes from the plant, changing different manufacturing processes due to manufacturing issues, not to mention paying the employees that manages the manufacturing communication. All these are very expensive and add up really quickly. But that's just the tip of the iceberg. They also created an entire software development kit, which as I mentioned before, is a really good one. And also an entire free game making tool in the form of pulp. There are costs to paying the software developers to work on this. In addition, we haven't even talked about the 24 games that come with the device. The developers of those games should be compensated in some way. And on top of that, they got Teenage Engineering who made the OP1 to design the Playdate. And I imagine there are very high costs associated with outsourcing the design. In fact, considering all these factors, the question in my mind is not how is the Playdate $179, but instead, how is the Playdate only $179? I cannot for the life of me calculate how the Playdate could be at all profitable considering all these costs. You can see it from a design perspective, but even from a cost analysis, you can really tell that this was a labor of love. Anyways, I just wanted to make this video because I wanted to shed some light on this situation because it seems like nobody knows anything about this. Subscribe if you want to see more Playdate content. I'm currently working on a Playdate game that I think is really cool and you definitely don't want to miss it. See you next time.